Shop Talk Live, episode number 205. Anissa and myself joined by David Duyard, Windsor Chairmaker Extraordinaire. But first, I, I've got something exciting to tell everyone about. Uh, we just started publishing our newest video workshop here at Fine Woodworking. And this one is featuring Shop Talk Live's very own Mike Pekovich. And if you've become a fan of Mike through the podcast, this is the video series for you to watch. It's unscripted. It's real time. It is Mike Pekovich as true to life as I know him. Um, there are successes. There are failures. There's everything in between. You're going to be peeking in the shop as Mike builds his hanging wall cabinet with Kumiko. It's a fantastic project featuring so many woodworking techniques. If I'm honest, this is one of those things that makes me scream from the mountaintop that there's no better deal in woodworking right now than the unlimited membership. In any format outside of finewoodworking.com, this video series would cost you hundreds of dollars. That is not an exaggeration. Eight hours of video, 25 episodes, unlimited members get access to this and 70 others like it for eight nine dollars a month so head on over to finewoodworking.com become an unlimited member and if you are looking to receive an unlimited membership uh for the holidays here's something weird why don't you send me an email shoptalk at taunton.com and send me the email of a person that you really want to send a subtle or not so subtle hint to that you want to receive an unlimited membership this holiday season and i will make sure it gets done i will personally send them an email and tell them all right, so on with the show. Here is our first episode with David Duyard, who is the instructor, the star of our Learning Curve video series, Turning for Furniture Makers, right after this announcement from our sponsor. When you're in the middle of a long sanding session, inevitably, you're going to start to think, I wonder if this sanding disc is old and used up. And I found that the best time to switch to a new sanding disc is the moment you think about it. Every second after that is wasted time. Maverick Abrasives is a family-run manufacturer of all things abrasives, such as sanding belts and sanding discs. Their manufacturing facility is located in Anaheim, California, where knowledgeable experts are on call Monday through Friday to answer any sanding or finishing questions you have. Head on over to maverickabrasives.com and check out their wide assortment of sanding discs. They've got you covered with the best prices on the web, whether you use 5-hole, 8-hole, or festool-hole pattern discs. To top it off, they have free shipping on orders of $200 or more. So join fellow Mavericks Ramon Valdez and Philip Morley and stock up at maverickabrasives.com today. So, <clears throat> Anissa, we are here joined by our uh, turning instructor. Have you, have you turned since? No. <laughs> no, I haven't. Not, you haven't? Not a lick of turning. I thought you I thought you got a lathe. I have Liz's lathe. I bought <clears throat> a lathe a couple years prior to our turning videos. Mm -hmm. And I had planned on just keeping up the momentum and just getting in the shop and turning. It just mm -hmm. hasn't happened. I also have not my New Year's resolution last year was to draw constantly. <laughs> I started drawing a day. I ha not one. I, I'm ashamed to admit. You are you disappointed? I'm yeah. disappointed. Yeah. Why are you asking him? I'm disappointed. <laughs> yeah, I expect I expected big things. I did too. Someday. And then it, I'll go back and I'll rewatch the videos and, and it'll all come back and I then think, I'll practice. I, I think it's like a I I think it's like riding a bike. It it doesn't go away because there there is a few months in between turning spells for me mm -hmm. and I don't ever feel like there's any catch up period. It's just, I'm not afraid of it now. Yeah. So that's all that that's is. Huge. Yes. That's, what, that's what matters. Yeah. Um, I wish I had your lathe because my lathe is kind of, well, it's fine. Again, it's one of those like lathes with a pedigree where it's like, you know, I got it from Mike so you can't make excuses about how your work turns out when it comes. You can't blame the tool when you get it from Mike because you know that he's You've made seen the stuff wonderful he's seen, things yeah. with it. 
Um, I got, what did I, I think that week I went out and got the parting tool that you have. Ah, the three eights. Yeah. Yeah, the three eights parting tool. And um, that has turned into a favorite. I still need to get a good skew. I'm using like an old, you know, craftsman $20 set skew that I've sharpened. And it's it's sharp and it works, but I need a good skew. A good skew helps. Yeah, yeah. I've I've added a couple skews to the to the mix lately. So I went to one of the um, uh, a round skew. So it's a five eighths inch round skew, and it's uh, it's been fun to play with. I haven't quite fully five mastered eighths. it yet. That's small. It's small. It? Yeah, yeah. But you see a lot of the guys that are they're. They're doing all their work with a half inch skew. Really? You know, so it's so it's I figure, well, five eighths is is good. And I found the round one because so I saw it on Instagram. Mm -hmm. and thought it, hey, this is pretty cool. And uh it's been fun. So it's really nice on small things. I haven't mastered it on big flat surfaces yet. Is it is it harder to sharpen? No, it's actually easier. I would think you wouldn't have like a solid registration to to hold it to the grinder with. <clears throat> yeah, no, because I'm using the uh, was it the Timberwolf? So it has a the the V notch that that sticks out the end and the sort of butt of it, the butt of it sits in there and then you just touch it, touch it. Through oh, the so so you're not using if on in the videos that we made the skew you were using like the normal grinder rest the um the Wolverine yeah yeah the Wolverine rest. that's it yep um but for the for this skew you used the the, yeah, the arm with the V. Yeah, the, the, the arm, V catch. The yeah, extendable arm thing. Yeah, so, yeah, oh, just okay. like it would uh, the you know the roughing gouge. Oh, and so with a five eighths inch wide blade, you're able to just zzz, just zzz, zzz, that's it. Just tip it in, and you're done. And done. Much. Yeah. Oh, that would be a nice thing about five eighths not having to. Yeah. Yeah, it's quick and, it quick, and, the, quick and easy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's quick and easy. Huh. Interesting. I saw something on Instagram. Michael Cullen had these really beautiful, I think they were tops, and they had this cool pattern on them, and he said it was like a chatter tool or something. What is that? Yeah, it's a bowl maker's tool. I think it just vibrates as it goes in, so it digs in at, in some kind of pattern. Yeah. Is that how he does this? That's what he said in one of the comments. It was really beautiful, and, and then he added a lot of color in just magical ways, so it was... It was yeah, and both effects together were just pretty great. I've yeah, because every Christmas time he he starts turning tops. It seems like you know it, it, it's his holiday thing. And have you do, do you follow Michael Cullen? No, he, he's I'll have to look him up. A great follow on, on yeah. Instagram, and I think Mike recommended it following his account a couple of episodes ago. And um, he does little tops, and but there's like this little squiggle. Yeah. It's a that squiggle. It almost looks like um, like an orbital sander squiggle. Almost like, an orbital like sander a, yeah. big a portion yeah. of it, and it just goes around. You know what it always reminds me of? You you know those like things that you would put a pen in with gears around it. Spirograph. And, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm always like, how does he do that? Yeah. Oh, okay. I love Spirograph. I always, even as a kid, I looked at it and I was like, yeah, it's going to get old after five minutes. Oh, no. no. I could just, buy, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For hours. Hours. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Way cool designs. <laughs> <laughs> David really perked up there. <laughs> so, um, you know what I just realized is we should introduce you to the podcast audience because m maybe not everyone knows. You, you, so, David, what do you do? You are. I'm a chair maker. There you go. So, uh, uh, so, and and you do a lot of um, you make a lot of Windsor chairs, make a lot of chairs, Windsor chairs, ladder back chairs. You uh, do a lot of refurbishing of it's. It seems like you you've had a few commissions in the past where it's like I had to fix this chair and then make two more to match it. Yes. Are those fun projects? Those are fun projects. Yes. Yeah, so, so early on, uh, I apprenticed with this guy. And, uh, New York, and he took everything in that he could to to keep the shop open, and we fixed tons of chairs, and it's kind of where I I kind of picked up liking them, and so um, you know fixing them is pretty easy, 
and then, you know, just kind of fascination of uh, all the different designs and different, uh, um, you know, variances and all these vernacular things that it's it's fun to pick them up. And then I get to to keep a new design. Mm-hmm. So and and hang on to it. So that's been it's been fun. But I, I pick I've been picking up a lot of those where I'm copying. I'm I'm doing one now where it's a it's a six foot long federal style bench. Almost looks like a really old Hitchcock. I'm making a copy. And it, oh, is that the settee that you're working on now, or? No, I just finished a big uh, six foot settee as a sack back. Okay. Big sack back. All right. And then this is a uh, it's another six foot, but it looks like a, it looks like an old Hitchcock Federal style. It's got you know Windsor Windsor construction, but the uh, there's a lot of screws and what's other just turning. describe a Hitchcock fit. I don't know what that is. So it's uh, all the fancy stuff on the. Uh, and the winters were gone, so chairs are starting to be automated, and they're, um, you know, interchangeable parts, and, um, you know, a lot of straight things. So all the finagling of getting stuff in. So the so the crest rail is actually screwed to the arm posts from the oh, back, okay. and then the arms are actually kind of screwed in from the from the side as well, and they're. Um, um, you know, what they did is to to make up for some of that, they stenciled everything. So you see a lot of these old stencil stencil pieces, and it, so it's covered in stencils. And there's no, you know, there's a lot of gutter carving on the winter chairs. There's no gutter carvings in this. They're painted in. So They're has, painting the gutter in. So, yeah, so they just paint the gutter in. It's, a, you know, almost a light mustard color chair, and then it's got black stripes that have been painted, hand-painted on. Huh. What's that book that you had shown me a while ago of all of the painted Windsor chairs? It was, I mean, I, I feel like it was. Oh, it's one of Nancy Coyne Evans' book. So she's a curator down at Winterthur. And uh, it's, a, it's a fabulous book if you're into Windsor chairs. There's, she's actually produced three volumes of it. There's Nancy enough freedom Coyne material. Evans. And I, I mean, I couldn't believe some of the painting on on. These chairs yeah. that, like, when you think of Windsor chairs, it's just like one solid color, you know, milk paint, two tone, maybe. Yeah, and as these they got in out of, the, out of the colonial days into the 1800s, they were painting and decorating by hand, and you know whether it came out of the more decorative arts or or some of the history and how it transitioned, you know, is kind of remains to be seen, but. Um, that's what happened. You know, how do I make them easier, quicker, yeah. you know, for the, more for the masses than. Are you, are you having to match that painting then? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's not happening. Okay. <laughs> no, that's not happening. I, I may do some of the, some of the lines, but any of the stenciling, I just can't do. I just don't have the skills, mm. but I may try to find some stencils or something. I'll have to. Fool around with them. Yeah. Cool. Right on. Yeah, that's a that's a fun project. Very cool. And and you um, you used to do a lot of flat work. When you you lived in I, California and you studied I with said, Ian yeah, Kirby. I, I did. Yep. Yep. So I was I was out there. I did a ton of flat work, and I've done everything from kitchens and beds and dressers to to uh, you know libraries and things. And um, I just kind of got tired of all the sheet goods and the dust and the big machines and slowly evolved as I started doing work with Ian, who's a huge hand tool advocate, mm-hmm. you know, um, that I like doing more and more of the hand tools and then slowly started getting into chairs and it's quieter, <laughs> less dust, <laughs> you know, but still it's keeps the brain engaged and it's, it's you know, because of the complications of all the angles. And things. Mm-hmm. Right on. Well. Should we answer some questions? Sure. You go for it. All right. It's a good batch. This is my favorite one ever, I think. Really? Yeah. Well, wow, this is especially Dean's question. It's, okay, so some of these uh, and I you know what? Let me acknowledge something. I got a an email um from a listener. It was kind of a mean email, I'm not going to lie. But one of the points he brought up uh, was very valid. And he goes, why why do you take so long to answer questions? You know, you always joke about this question was sent in six months ago or whatever. And and there's two reasons for that. We get more questions than we answer. So they pile up. And also, I save questions for the person I think might best answer it. Oh, Ah. so you thought... I would be the best person to answer 
the question about refuse. No, I thought David would be. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thank you. I think. (laughs) I didn't see him say this is right up my alley, though. (laughs) So, but just just for the record, I have like a whole list of folders. And I'll, you know, say David Duyard, Bob Van Dyke, Barry, Anissa, blah, you know, whoever, you know, just all all sorts of different people that I plan on having on the show. And when a question comes in I'll, and I think of someone like, oh, who do I who do I think would answer this question really well? I throw it in that folder. And then when those folders fill up with like free, it's a drive, not that big of that, not that long of a drive, but it's a drive for you to come down here. So we record two episodes in one day. Yeah. When I get eight questions in that folder, I call you up, you know, or when there's eight questions in the Bob Van Dyke folder, that's when Bob comes in and we record. So sometimes they're not the most timely answers, but there's a, a justifiable good reason for that. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, now, refuse. <laughs> <laughs> this one is from uh, Uber friend of the show, Dean Hedstrom. Uh, let's see. I am burdened by shavings and sawdust accumulated in my dust collector. In all respects, that is a good thing. However, what does one do with 30 gallons of shavings? For some years, I piled bin after bin in a pile, hoping the shavings would compost into a nice fertile loam. Mm-hmm. Alas, alas, alas. <laughs> Even with the annual addition of high nitrogen fertilizer and periodic forking the pile never reduced. Um, I should have known better. For 40 years before the mill that I worked at had a boiler, for, for the 40 years before the mill that I worked at had a boiler, shavings and sawdust was blown into piles. 50 years later, those piles remain. I could properly dispose of the shavings with my weekly commercial rubbish collection, but that does not seem to be an environmentally sound method. Lately, I have been throwing shovel f- shovelfuls into the wind with hope of spreading the shavings across a larger area. <sighs> Fortunately, I have a forested <laughs> lot, and a bin of shavings thus spread, la- thus spread are not unsightly. Um, any suggestions or wisdom regarding disposal of shavings? And when I think of somebody who accumulates a lot of shavings pretty fast. Yeah. I do. <laughs> That's true. A ton. I feel like I've, I remember Brisbane and just like. She just lays on them. She, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She, just, she comes in. It's her favorite song to shop is. Yeah. It's a dog bed. <laughs> She's now, in there. But all of us are, are blessed with wood stoves. And shavings in the wintertime are the greatest thing for starting fires. So I know that that's what. So that's part of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I give bags away to. People have wood stoves, but the, okay. all the shavings coming out off the lathe are not good for uh, are not good for starting fires. They're just too small, and uh, I compost all that. There's, I fill up a I fill up a trash can, on, you know, every couple of weeks, easy, mm-hmm. and I compost them, but, and, and they compost. Are... No, no, they can't. They take up. Uh, they take up too much nitrogen to put them directly into a garden. Okay. So you got to pile them up. Now the issue is, is that. The wood is dry, right? And it needs to be wet for it to decompose. Oh. Right? Mm-hmm. So, and then it's helpful. It, then you, you know, most of the, most of the stuff I, I'm using mostly air dried, but uh, if it's kiln dried, right, it's been dried, so all the bugs are killed. Mm-hmm. So you've got to introduce bugs and you've got to get it wet. And if you do that, it'll, it'll compost down pretty nice and you'll get some nice loam and it takes about two years. So, so uh, but you're doing this. You're not... Yeah, yeah. So I take it out in the back, and I've got a couple big piles, and I keep piling it in. And if it's really dry outside, then it's uh, I'll throw some water on there, get a garden hose on it, or mix it up. And then uh, uh, every once in a while, if it's I see it's not composting, you can go to the big box store and buy some compost starter. And and that's just bacteria. It's just bacteria. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You throw it in there, and you know, all of a sudden, a couple months later, you'll see it. It's like it's starting to turn black, and it turns really good, and you can put it in. Okay, so w- would you do the same with dust? Because you don't create a lot of dust as a chair maker. No, I do, but I take uh, the uh, anything that comes out that's uh, that gets sucked up in the vacuum. You know, stuff mm-hmm. from the bandsaw. You know, from yeah. all the saws that that gets mm-hmm. into the dust collector, and that that all gets composted too. Okay. The only thing I don't compost is walnut. I, I remember when I took that chair yeah, class I felt so from bad. you. <laughs> no, no, actually, there, there's still piles of walnut shavings in my garage. 
because my wife is obsessed with using them as, a, as some natural dye or whatever. And yeah. It's I don't know. It's just I just keep moving this bag of walnut shavings from one location to the other. But um, so yeah, she uses it as a natural dye, or she experiments with it. Uh, oak shavings, um, walnut. I think anything with a lot of tannins. A lot of tannins. Yeah, yeah. hickory gives you a really nice color. Huh. Okay. Yeah, we shave down the hickory bark for the for the ladder backs, and you soak it. That, that stuff just turns a beautiful red brown. Mm. Oh. Why did you? What made you feel bad about when Ben was there? Did he do something? No, no, because I had. A, I, I was trying to be overcompensating on my composting and being green. So there were there were a couple other guys there that were working on cherry, and Ben was working on walnut. No, oh. no, 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 the no other way, I was cherry. You were cherry. Yeah, they, they were walnut. Oh. Right, and so, so I was we're trying. We're all quarantine. So, so I was quarantine. <laughs> So, so because I, I, I can compost the cherry, but the walnut, if you mix it in, it kills out of everything around it. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's uh, so I, that goes to the town dump, but anything else goes into the compost pile. Um, Nancy Hiller had a blog recently in her prose corner section of the website about what she does with all the the shavings and and that. Because she's a pro and accumulates way more than I would yeah. ever. Um, I didn't see that. It's on the website. Check <laughs> uh, it out. I'm, let, me, let me find it. I should have pulled it up earlier. Um, but uh, she sends a lot of her dust, her fine dust from um, like collecting from uh, yeah, coming sanding, off a table saw or, or sanding yeah, or something. Yeah. yeah. And she sends that she has a friend who uh, is a potter, and I guess they use that mixed with something to make oh, like little God. standoffs or something for the kiln. I don't know. Huh. Um, yeah. What I, do you do with yours? I have chickens, so I just I just did this a couple of days ago. I dumped. Um, I cleaned out the chicken house and I I lined the whole house with the sawdust from my dust collector because they were kind of big chips. I was planing a lot and uh, they were pine and cedar and the whole – I have a nice comfy pad for them. Mm -hmm. You can mix it into your litter box. I use cups of it sometimes and I throw it to get in with the fire to just get, get stuff started. Um with some of the kindling, what else do I line the garden with it, pat it down a lot where I want no weeds to grow, and then I throw some of it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the all the paths. Yeah, I got, I got yeah. a guy down the street with twenty chickens. I give him bags. Yeah, oh, he loves it. And but, I also have a neighbor who works at a camp where the kids go. They just they go to the summer camp and they they always need sawdust because they're just digging holes for their toilet for the couple weeks they're oh, there. Okay. <laughs> so they need a lot of sawdust. sawdust. So she takes a lot of my sawdust too. Huh, okay. Yeah. I have a tendency of um normally I'm I'm in the shop at night and it's dark when I realize that my my I don't I don't have much of a dust collector per se. So most of it is um I have like one of those Anita uh shop vac separator things. So I have a tendency of just walking straight out of my shop and dumping the five-gallon bucket across the other side of the driveway where there, we have this whole area of pachysandra that we just want to get rid of. You don't know. That, that stuff is— That's just fertilizing it. Yeah. <laughs> pachysandra, they're like cockroaches. Well, they're, yeah. Been, <laughs> so I, I mow it hate down. That stuff. I mow it down, <laughs> and I just dump— as much stuff on top of it as I can. And it keeps coming back though, right? Is it working? I feel like it's kind of working. I don't know. I kind of ignore that part of the yard. Hence why there's just piles of sawdust everywhere. Um, but my, my problem is a lot of times when I'm cleaning up, I'll be vacuuming and all of a sudden be like, you suck up, you know, a pile of metal shavings or something like that from the drill press. And it's like, oh, crap. Now I can't dump this easily in the yard and not worry about it. Because I figure, you know, all of a sudden my kid's going to be walking barefoot and then there's 
Hopefully not through the pack of Sandra. (laughs) (laughs) But Dean, uh, I mean, I guess the best option is keep the piles wet. That's, I mean, get some compost compost starter. starter. Add in some grass clippings or other stuff to get some bugs in there. That's all. I thought that this would be a good um, opportunity for a, a website survey. Uh, so I'm, I'll in the show notes for for this episode, I'll post a, a survey of what and post in the comments what you do with your shavings. If anyone's got a good idea uh, for Dean, we're open to any ideas. Let's see. Okay. Let's see. Question number two from Greg. Every few months or so, I ask myself if I should buy a joiner. It feels like it would be nice, but I can't seem to justify the investment. I've been buying S2S lumber from an online hardwood dealer and have had good luck getting straight and true boards. So um, anyone who doesn't know, S2S means that it has been surfaced, surfaced on two sides. So usually kind of a straight line rip and skip planed. Um, I figured I'm paying a premium of several dollars per board foot over rough cut lumber, but I'm also not spending hours preparing wood. When I think about buying a joiner, I can't see purchasing a six inch since everyone seems to regret that and wish they had bought an eight inch. Additionally, I have a small basement and it currently isn't wired for 220. So I'd have the hassle of getting it into the basement and rewiring. I figure I'm looking at a $1,500 investment at a minimum. Even at $5 per board foot premium, I'd need to process at least 300 board feet before breaking even. That's probably at least two years worth of projects given my current pace. Um, What am I missing? Is the investment really worth it? You have a six-inch joiner. I have a six-inch joiner. That's all I use. I I went for a decade or more without any joiner. So did I. Well, not quite that long, but I didn't have a joiner for Yeah, I did everything by hand. And and finally finally broke down and got one just co- for speed, yeah. You know to get to get stuff done. You know and um, but you know my comment is I guess even with a lot of the the, the two S stuff it it'll still warp afterwards. Mm-hmm. You know so I, I guess it depends on what you look to do with it now. You know so if you're just looking to uh, to flatten and edge join some things, a six inch is fine. Mm-hmm. And mine's one ten. It's it's a powermatic. It's an old one, but it's. It uh, works just fine, but if you're trying to flatten really wide boards, then you know it's probably not gonna not gonna do the trick. So I guess it depends on what you want to be, what you're using it for. You know, all my parts are all mostly four inches or under that I'm looking to, to either flatten or edge join, right? So I don't, I'm not looking at at these ten, twelve inch boards. And when I do, I I go to a friend shop. <laughs> <laughs> let somebody, let somebody, let somebody else have it. <laughs> Um, I did the buying S2S lumber for a long time. Uh, when I was in Nashville, there was a place maybe half an hour drive away that I could, you could sort, you could pick through those stacks and pick out just the right board. There was no pressure. There was no, nobody's on a forklift standing over you. And, um, so you were able to really cherry pick the boards. And I guess if you're online shopping, they post pictures and everything and you can kind of do the same thing. <clears throat> so it's totally doable to me. It's just one of those things that now that I have a joiner, I don't ever want to not have a joiner. Yes. Would you rather have a six inch or no joiner? No, a six inch jointer. That was a stupid question. No that was like jointer. the worst question yeah. I've ever come up with. But at the same time, <clears throat> you don't absolutely need one. I've, I'm actually, I was working with a bunch of live edge boards um, in the last couple of weeks, and I was doing that trick a lot where you're using a flat surface, and I used it to actually, like underneath on the planer, I used it that way, and I also used it, um, I tacked these live edge boards down to a piece of plywood, a long piece on like use it as a sled to put it through the table saw too. And I was actually thinking about this question too before we got it. You don't really need it. You don't really need the jointer and you could definitely do without it, but I have one. I would never give it up and I would rather have one than not have it because you could be more spontaneous with a jointer than you can without one. That's 
it's when I think about the way that I work now, I, I never use the joiner for half an hour at a stretch. I use the joiner for 30 seconds and then it doesn't get turned on for two weeks. You know, it's, you know, I'm resawing at the bandsaw and I'm, you know, trying to do a bunch of ukulele sides. So I'm, you know, resaw joint, resaw joint, resaw joint. It's the convenience of that. But that's something I could easily do with a six inch joiner. Mm -hmm. And like you said, a 110 six inch joiner, you could probably pick up an old Delta. I, well, I mean, I bought it from Tom um, and has since given it to my brother. But I think I paid 200 bucks for an old 56 inch Delta. It was in great shape. Yeah. Actually, it was in pretty not great shape, but it was very functional, you know? So <clears throat> I think I would look in, into that. And then if you find yourself being annoyed by the six inch capacity, go up. Start saving up. But I, it's just a convenience factor for me. What do you have for a planer? I have a uh, lunchbox, the wall, 13 inch. Okay. So yeah, man, I, got, I, I ended up, I had one for. I don't know, 18 years, and finally it started getting where it wasn't. Uh, I was getting different thicknesses from edge to edge. Really? Yeah. So, so not enough to, to. But if I'm doing really thin slats for ladder backs, uh -huh. it made a difference. So, um, but I I had had it for 15 years. Yeah. You know, and uh, so I bought the uh, I bought the new Dewalt about a year or so ago, and uh, I think it's got three three blades instead of two. It's dual speed, and it, mm -hmm. it handles everything I need. I need. I said, if I need a bigger one, I go. I go somewhere. Yeah. My local mill has a huge planer, so if I need something really big, I'll I'll bring some boards there, and they'll they'll throw it through in one pass. <laughs> well, so you can bring boards to your mill, and they'll do it. Yeah, I would think that they'd be wary of that for unknown boards. They're you know, yeah, if they look good, you know, they're uh, they can they can see them, you know. But I I had I had an opportunity to buy a, a huge amount of. Uh, um, nine quarter poplar and it was bowed unbelievably and I needed an inch and three quarters and I brought it there and they they just billed me by the hour and, <laughs> <laughs> and it was wonderful because I didn't have to hand plane it and it certainly wasn't going to fit through you know I mean there were 20 inch 22 inch wide boards they weren't going to fit through anything I had what were you doing with the poplar hmm? table chair seats oh okay gotcha. yeah right on <clears throat> All right. Well, let's see. I think it's time for our all-time favorite techniques of all time for this week. Who wants to go first? Should we? I mean, we have to offer it to our yeah, our guest. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to go first, or do you want to kick it? Don't matter. Kick the can down the road. I'll go. I'll go first. All right. So, so I hadn't done this in, in actually a long time, but yesterday I had. I've been working on these ladder backs and making them out of oak. And because I'm dealing with air-dried stuff, it doesn't always dry even. And I got a whole series of tiny checks in a finished chair leg. Ooh. So what do I, what do, I do with them? Right. So the first thing is uh, if you get some real th – I took some real thin set um, cyanoacrylate, you know, and drop it in there. It soaks it in there, and they're not going to check anymore. And then, oh, um, so you're kind of like sizing it and just sizing it and getting it in there, right? And it, it just soaks in there and, and drops in. And then you can scrape off anything around there so it won't affect the finish. But then um, I pulled out my old shellac sticks. So they're burning sticks. And so you can and match this, this the color. is like a, a, it's a stick of solid it's shellac. It's a stick, and you get a, and you get a little uh, heated heat paddle, and you, you burn, take a little bit off the, off the stick, and, and it's, fairly liquid and you can put it in there and it comes in, I don't know, like 24 different colors. I bought a kit like, you know, 25 years ago or something and, uh, fills in, fills in the cracks just beautifully. And, and you mix the color to match with you can, other, you can and have to, they had like 24 different colors. So, oh, so like, I found one, that, one, I found that, one yeah. that matched. Yeah. So filling a crack with shellac stick. Yeah. Yeah. I think Balin's calls them burning sticks or something, burning sticks, something like that. But they're, uh, they're, they've they're been a godsend over the years. You know, you find these, you have a beautiful polished surface and all of a sudden there's like this little ding or something that's in there and and uh, you can go in there and 
and fill it in, and because it's shellac, all the finishes stick to it. Right. So, how you know, it and you can than, sand it. Then sawdust and glue it's immediate. Or... Okay, it's, it's quick immediate. And... It's quick. It's immediate. You know, you're 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 sanding ten seconds later, and as soon as it cools, and you know, when you can match the colors that you want, you don't got to worry about you know glue getting into the pores, and then you know not taking finish and stuff yeah. like that. Huh. All right, that's a good one. Have you ever used shellac stick? Yeah. Mm -mm. But I like it. Yeah. Because uh, <clears throat> even if filling with epoxy, you have to worry about the finish with that. Yeah. So that makes sense. I would try that. Yeah. And the, and the CA glue first is smart. Otherwise, all the shellac would soak in there. Yeah. 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 Or it can continue to check. So you're kind of locking. Yeah, so I'm trying to lock the check so it doesn't check anymore. Yeah. Now, the stuff has been really dry already, so I don't think it's going to check anymore. And they're not huge pieces of wood, but, you know, you never know. And it, it only checks on the, you know, on the on the plain face, on the tangential face. So it's – but you get the tiny – these little checks going right up the leg Sometime of a chair. And it's oak? just like – yeah, it's white oak. Sometimes – the one of the only times that I've worked extensively with white oak, all of a sudden – it was like I, I milled everything up and it came in the next day. It was like, you've got to be kidding. Yeah. Just yeah. surface checks everything. Just surface checks. Yeah. That never seems to happen to Mike. He just doesn't tell us about it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's all about hiding your mistakes. <laughs> it's all about hiding your mistakes. It's all about hiding them, but then not confessing to them after you hide them. <laughs> Part B. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, you're really bad at that. Yes. <laughs> the confession part or the hiding part? Yeah. <laughs> the confession part. <laughs> she relishes Because I'm it. always just like, oh, really? <laughs> uh, 10.30 at night, text from Anissa. <laughs> oh, we're having this. Um... <laughs> What's your, uh, you want to go next? Um, I was doing this. I've been in my shop a bunch lately for stupid things, but... Um, Hiding Christmas presents. No, if only. I have quarreling cat issues at my house, and I'm building fences all over the place. <laughs> um, anyway, so as the speed tenon, Chris Bexford, the first time I ever saw him do the speed tenon. Do we have a video of him doing that? I think we have a video of Asa doing it. Um, it's so great, you... It's very controversial. It, it is very controversial, but I know I've tried to get into a few articles, and I do a, I do a, a slow speed tenon kind of technique that I just feel a little bit safer. Like he's got it down so well that he's just – it's like super speed. But even doing my slow method, which is very choppy and robotic, it's still a really fast, really effective method of just like doing half laps or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, so can the, you explain the process? Uh, well, you know, you're going to, you have your, your miter fence in the, in the track on the saw and rather than putting in a dado blade or taking a thousand little passes and bumping that, that stock one way or the other, you're kind of, you know how you do a cove cut on the table saw, you're kind of doing that incrementally, but everything's straight. You know so what I mean? You're pulling the stock you're across. You're pushing the stock. The, the stock across the edge of the – so you, you do your shoulder cut first. Like I was doing half laps this day and you do your shul shoulder cut first and then you move the piece up to mm -hmm. the left of the blade and then you kind of zip it into the front of the blade across to the fence that's set. Yeah, there's and no elegant way of explaining this there one. There isn't. It's really <laughs> difficult. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I swear we have a video of him doing no, we, it. I, I, I'm sure. I'll, I'll or take somebody. Something yeah. But then you go a little bit closer to the blade and you zip so that you're getting this just like you're you're incrementally going to the full height of the blade across the piece. It's really hard to explain. Well, it's so effective and it's actually. Well, I don't want to say anything that I'm going to regret, but it's, it works well. And it, it works really well. Really, really well. I've, I've done it many times. Um, and it is definitely one of those things that watch a video. And if you sit there and go, no, you're crazy. If you don't feel comfortable doing yeah, it, don't, don't do, do it. it. Don't, don't listen to Anissa. Yes. Don't <laughs> listen to me. Period. <laughs> but, um, 
I remember, so like, nah, it was probably like 10 years ago, Outsider, I was not working here. I remember Asa posting a video of the speed tenon and like asking, do you think this is safe? And there was this huge controversy. It was like, you're fine woodworking. You're supposed to tell us what's safe. And there is like always this weird gray area of like, you know, what's safe for you might not be safe. So that's why I always say like, if it... If the if the if the hackles come up on the back of your neck yeah, when definitely. when you see this, do not attempt it. And um, when I do it, when I feed in, I always pull away from the blade. And I think I've when I've seen oh, Chris do it, he goes towards toward the, the blade. blade. Yeah. And I think it was Robert Lang from uh, Pop Wood. In the controversy, <laughs> he had posted saying like. There's a safer way of doing this. And I remember watching that and saying, yeah, I, I agree with that sentiment where he's you're, – you're not – your hand is not moving toward the blade at all. Um, it is moving away from the blade at all times. Mm -hmm. So that's the way that I do the speed tenon. That makes but sense. We'll, we'll, we'll post the videos and everything. It's, it's – as with Chris, almost everything he does at times is like, what? But – it is steeped in fundamentals and sound reasoning. Advocating for it, you mean? Yes. Yes. And I think when you watch him do it, he's just got, there's no, I'm not as robotic as I'm making it sound. It's just, he's just like, zzz, 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 and it's cut. And you're just like, wait, what did you do? And once I got my head around the concept of what he was doing, it just makes it's so easy yeah, and so fast and it feels quite comfortable. Yeah. So what's your method of tenoning? I have a, uh, well, almost all my tenons are round. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, chair so, guy. So when I, when I have to. <laughs> I, this, I well, you know what's funny is this, just side note, I remember you pointing out it's not, you're not drilling a hole, you're drilling a mortise. I was like, the heck is this guy going on about? <laughs> and then you said there's a different mentality between yeah. drilling a mortise and drilling a hole. And it was like, oh my God, that makes sense. You're, you know, it's like there's a precision when there's you a drill precision a hole. There's a precision you got to have to it. Just like there's going to be round precision in your. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry. So I know. I've, I just always love that, that yeah. idea. All right. But, we, all right, flat. Flat I have tenons. a I have a tenoning jig for like, a table saw. Like one of like those little delta. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah the old yeah. delta one. You know, it's fallen off enough where all the handles are broken, but it still <laughs> works. And <laughs> you know, and and you know, you get them dialed in, and they're it's very accurate, very easy, very quick. You know, you can do angled tenons mm -hmm. on it. It's easy to set up. Mm -hmm. So I've used that for years, and it uh, still sits next to the saw and gets used every once in a while. Yeah. Yeah. I I accidentally left one of those in the basement in Nashville. Ooh. You know what I just realized, though? I know the people who own the house, yeah. and maybe it's still in there. All right. Email Note James. to self. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So my all-time favorite technique of all time for this week is um, I've always had, you know, when you buy setup blocks those, and you get the one, two, three block? It's a metal block, one inch by two inch by three inches. And I, I remember getting it. Like, oh, this is going to be super useful. And I never, ever, 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 ever used it. I use my setup blocks all the time, um, but the one, two, three block never really came in use. And then I was sawing something with a, with a Japanese saw, a um, little Dazuki, and I needed it to be dead on. And I thought, well, what can I do to make this easier? Well, you know, you see all those little magnetic jigs. So I took... I had a bunch of sheet magnets from like that you would stick a business card on. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I cut a piece of sheet magnet and I stuck it to the side of this one, two, three block. And now anytime I need to saw something, because a lot of what I do is there's no real reference surface. It's all like weird round parts and you just need a straight line in this exact spot right now. I will take that setup block with the magnet stuck to it, and I will set it on the thing, right on the line, clamp it, stick my Japanese saw to the side of it, 
and it saws perfectly straight, perfectly plumb every single time. So I just have a setup block with a magnet stuck to it that I clamp to things. And it's, I use it all the time now. Once a week, probably. Am I making sense? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's one of those, oh, yeah, that makes so yeah. much sense. Yeah, and it's like, you know, all of these magnetic guide blocks and everything like that, I swear this little sheet magnet that I got, you know, a pack of in Staples for, you know, 15 years ago, is it, it's plenty strong enough to hold a, a, a Dazuki right where you need it to be. So I should That's just like using a flush cut saw, I would think. You and right? you could do it with a flush cut saw, yeah. and and honestly, you could do it with a flush cut saw and a scrap of wood and a magnet embedded in it. Um, I've actually since then made a um, a fretting jig that is it's you know it holds a fretboard blank, and uh, this was after my my drastic smooth mm-hmm. move. Uh, it holds a fretboard blank, and it's just got a piece of MDF going across it with three you know, Lee Valley magnets embedded in the side, and that's what holds the saw perfectly in, in place. Um, so m- maybe the technique is making your own uh, sawing jig with magnets and straight things. I don't know. But that's what I made it up from the first time. But. All right. Well, let's take a quick break, and when we come back, uh, we're going to answer the age-old question, does bandsaw blade drift exist? Christian Bexford, Peter Follinsby, Peter Galbert, Chris Gochner, Garrett Hack, Dave Richards and David Heim, Nancy Hiller, Raleigh Johnson, Steve Lotta, Tom Lee Nielsen, Christina Madsen, Tom McLaughlin, Mike Pekovich, Chris Schwarz, Bob Van Dyke, and this year, the patron saint of hand tools, Roy Underhill. If that lineup doesn't get you excited, nothing will. Fine Woodworking Live 2020, April 17th through 19th, Southbridge, Massachusetts. Early bird registration right now. Get on it. Question number three from Butch. What is your opinion on bandsaw blade drift? I have a Laguna fence. I love it. (laughs) (laughs) i think it's highly overrated (laughs) i have a laguna fence and normally i don't name names uh, when people i edit the names out but i would assume he has a drift master fence on a 14 inch bandsaw which easily allows accommodating blade drift I have a Carter log mill that doesn't seem to drift at all. And if you watch the video on their sled, on Stockroom Supply sled for the Little Ripper from Canada, he says that blade drift is caused by forces released in the wood pushing against the fence as it passes past the blade. There are many people that say blade drift is a myth and it is caused by improper setup. And then there are many who will tell you how to accommodate the drift. Who is right? All right, let's end this one once and for all. They're all right. In a way, yeah. Yes. <laughs> all of the above. <laughs> so, David, you have a big old fancy Italian bandsaw. I do. Yep. That, I get rid of all my others. switch is always breaking. Yes. <laughs> to my third switch. <laughs> Won't name names. Do you have drift issues? You do um, a lot of resawing. I do a ton of resawing. Yeah. Um... I'm finding that if you keep it set up and keep your guides really good and your blade is sharp, I don't get drift. But as soon as that blade gets dull, it drifts all over the place. What do you use for a blade? Um, like bandsaw blades direct. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. Like just, a, a three TPI skip yeah, tooth? Yeah, three, three TPI skip tooth, mm-hmm. uh, standard half inch, half inch. Um, I used to rip with, you know, three quarter inch and inch blades and I find that they weren't. They weren't any better than uh, than the half inch blades were, as long as they were sharp. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, so for twenty five bucks a blade, you know, it's uh, and they're you know, my blades are pretty big. They're one hundred fifty three inch blades, 
So it's a matter of keeping the tension on the blade. And I, I don't. I learned early on from uh, from this old guy I worked with that you kind of ignore the settings on the bandsaw. So maybe I shouldn't be <laughs> proponent of this, <laughs> but you know, it's like crank it up and tune it like you would a guitar. So if it sounds like it's in tune, you have enough tension on the blade, and um, you know sometimes it corresponds with the what's the the indicator on the saw, and sometimes it doesn't. I, I've I've never been able to do that because I always want to like pull out like a strobe tuner or something. <laughs> <laughs> Yours is a little bit more sensitive than mine, I'll admit. You know, but uh, um, yeah, so I'm I'm probably have the tension a whole lot higher than what's recommended, mm-hmm. and. Um, you know, I just make sure that the, the guides are in line and they, they get out of whack every once in a while. You just got to pay attention to them. But, you know, I can resaw all day with a sharp blade and not have any drift. And I'm, I'm resawing down to, you know, under a quarter inch, mm-hmm. you know, mostly. So it's, you know, dead flat and throw two passes on a planer and I'm, that's all I need. Mm-hmm. What's your, uh, I, I bet you and I have similar takes on this one. Based on our jobs. Really? Yeah. Um, well, it, I don't think it's, I think there is something called drift. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, there's something, every time you change the blade, you're going to kind of reset up the positioning of the yeah. blade on the wheel. And that's kind of one of the major things that causes drift. So, I think once you do that and you get everything lined up and working and set the way you want it, you're not going to have to redo that every single time, but definitely when you're putting that new blade on. And I mean, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it being this mythical thing. It is something, whether whatever you think is causing it, you're going to have to either adjust the fence to match the blade or the blade to match the fence. Like you have to fix whatever is causing that discrepancy in your cut. I, I will say wasn't definitely not you. This is your first time on the show. And I don't think it was me. I don't think it was you, but there have been people sitting in these seats who have said blade drift doesn't exist. Well, and whatever I remember you, listening and being like, yes, but, it does. I'm having the problem right now. Whatever you're <clears> calling <throat> it, it does exist. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what's, it's just, so, what's the cost? Well, but <laughs> the, there, there was there was oh, there was many times an argument that it's just your your saw is not set up right. Duh, oh, rookie. Good thing it rookie, wasn't me. Rookie, rookie. rookie. <laughs> <laughs> um, your saw is not set up right. Yeah. And um, so there there's I always come back to when I go through the archives, the Fine Order King archives. I, I And I went through and I looked at Tim Rousseau's article and he shows you how to account for drift. I looked at Tim Coleman's article on resawing and he shows you how to account for drift. I looked at um, another, you know, like older, uh, all every resawing article show in, uh, in fine woodworking shows how to account for drift. Um, Michael Fortune will argue that proper bandsaw blade or a new f- blade and proper setup drift shouldn't happen. These are all people who I believe and I trust 100%. I can't possibly say that any one of them are wrong because they all make beautiful furniture and do it incredibly well and efficiently. So um, now that said, I went, I watched this little ripper video and I think, I think this guy and the Carter log mill and everything, that's all great if you're only ever ripping like two foot sections. Um, I'll post a, a link to the video in, in the show notes, but uh, it's basically like a, a, a mill attachment that holds the, the board in a carriage. And sure, there's no drift because the, the, there is something to the tension of the board is able to be released without hitting into a fence or anything like that. Well, then use an English style fence, pull the fence back. If that's the problem, uh, pull the fence back to just pass the blade and do your ripping that way or your, your, your resawing that way. Um, I've, I've totally, I, you, I resaw all the time. I use a quarter inch or a three sixteenths inch blade 
and I get straight drift free cuts. I swear to God. I believe you. Yeah. I, I'm normally shooting for about eighth of an inch. And I get, you know, a couple passes through planer. Uh, I, I do more than that just because I, I'm going thinner normally and I'm pushing the, like I, I plane down to two millimeters on my planer and sometimes they explode. <laughs> but do you put, yeah, I, I, yeah, I, get, I get a riser. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, get a yeah. riser block in there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but everybody is right about this one. You can account for drift. You can do it with a with a changing the, the adjusting the angle on your fence. How do you do? You ever change your your fence angle? You don't want to get me started talking about my bandsaw right now because well, Barry's Barry the broke la- it. Barry broke my bandsaw, Oof. so I still haven't <laughs> had a minute to go and change the tires <laughs> on there. But what do you do? Um, it depends if I'm in a real hurry, which I usually am, I'll cut it extra thick and then plate it down and joint in between if I'm resawing. Um, but if I'm going to take the time, I'm going to check everything and set it up and I'm going to make sure that the blade is tracking right. And, um, there's a trick that I learned at the Krenov school where you're adjusting the fence to the, to the blade. Mm-hmm. That's um, yeah. That's uh, Tim article and Tim Col- the Tims, the Tims, the Tims. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cover that. Yeah. Yeah. So it, ju- it just depends on my mood of the day and how much time I have. What, what size bandsaw do you have? 14 inch. Okay. You have a power Matic? Is that with like the is it European style or like old you know cast iron frame or boxed aluminum frame? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not no, it's not it's not an Anisa old. Nisa Capsas, yeah. <laughs> editor at Fine Woodworking. <laughs> no, it's fairly new. It's okay. a pretty new one. Yeah. Yeah, I just it's like. I had a friend message me uh, on Instagram a couple months ago, and he was like, I don't know whose video to follow. Do I follow so-and-so from this manufacturer, or do I follow this one from this one? And I do look at, like, if a manufacturer is trying to sell you their $400 thing, they're going to argue that their $400 thing is your answer. Going to solve the problem. So... I generally lean towards finding people who are not selling you anything. Um, and there's a lot of them out there who, who are able to get killer results. <clears throat> uh, and there's a lot of different ways of doing it. So pick your poison, Butch. I don't know. I don't have a, there's no solid answer. We can't. No. We can't end this day. It happens. <laughs> yeah. Sharp blade. It's the biggest thing. Uh, All right, quick question from Justin. What is the proper way to store rough milled lumber? I currently work in an 8x8 basement and storage space is slim to nothing. I have lumber stored vertically due to a lack of space. Would storing it vertically cause the boards to warp? And when I think of someone who has a lot of lumber stored, David DeYard. Yes, everywhere. You you have a (laughs) problem. Yeah, me too. (laughs) You have a little bit of a problem. I I have a problem. But there's no lumber. Can you still get in your driveway? Yeah. I can get a couple cars in there now. (laughs) So so you have lumber stored in your driveway under tarps, stickered. You have lumber stored, what, back by the table saw vertically. Yep. You have lumber stored every which way. Yep. Have you had any issues? I I think the issue is really controlling moisture. So so when you say it's rough lumber, does that mean it's air dried or it's kiln dried? Because you can get kiln dried rough lumber. And, um, you know, so I think it's because once it's been kiln dried or is dry, you can just stack it and you don't need to sticker it or anything. But until then, you need to sticker it and it's got to stay flat and stuff, you know. But, um, you know, once it's dry and I do, I have a 
I have a whole bunch of stuff next to the table saw. It's all stored vertically and it mm -hmm. doesn't warp or anything like that. But I'm also above ground. I'm not in a basement that could have high humidity. Oh, that's right? Because right? Yeah. Right? even if you get kiln dried lumber, it, it still moves, <clears throat> yeah. you know, and and uh, your relative humidity of where you are is going to affect that. Yeah. So I think that's the, the bigger issue is do I store it in a basement where it's humid or do I store it somewhere else where it's not? Yeah, I, whenever I think of a basement shop, I think of my old shop that was, you know, every month puddled. Yeah. You know, and I, so definitely keep it on risers or something if you could. It's got to be risers and it's probably stickered, I would think, if you're in a basement. Yeah. You know, because it's um, – because otherwise you want that equal amount of air around the board for if your humidity is going to change. And otherwise if it's not and it's pretty stable, you can just stack the stuff once it's dry. And you, you have an attic full of lumber, which could have the same moisture issues. As the basement? Well, I mean. Um, yeah, I have lumber all over as well, outside, inside. Um, I had some logs milled up on site, and those are stickered and outside, um, covered loosely or under cover so that they don't get rained on. Then I have a lot of kiln dried stuff that's outside and covered and stacked vertically and then I have stickered stuff up on the second floor of my shop um, and I haven't had problems with any of it okay so you've never like op sawed into a board and had it go weird and been like oh that was vertically stored that was no. yeah okay mm -mm. there's no way of as long as it's dry right you're good yeah, yeah. right on that's the key Keep it dry, Justin. All right. Let's see. We've got a listener comment, <clears throat> uh, five-star comment, uh, iTunes from Dog Food Guy. <laughs> I was hoping you would say that. <laughs> uh, I absolutely love this podcast. They have the right amount of humor with the right amount of information. I'm never bored listening. Uh, well, thank you for that. You. The five-star comment <laughs> <laughs> helps us uh, you know, climb the charts and be seen by other podcast listeners and everything so that is definitely awesome uh does anybody have any random recommendations i'll save i'll save it for next time it's a uh, long one okay <laughs> <laughs> uh mine is next time you're in an art supply store get like uh, i don't know if, if they use them for mixing paint or something but little spatulas the artist spatula uh i was in al breed's shop one time and he was always using he always had a little very thin metal spatula oh, to clear those, out yeah. the plain shavings yep. from whatever. And I was like, uh, if Albre does it, I'm going to do it. And I got one of those, and I use it all the time uh, for putting random sawdust and cracks. I'm about to fill a CA glue or yep. whatever, and just I reach for it all the time. Do you have anything random? I uh, uh, Rulers from Staples. They sell these inexpensive metal rulers that have a cork backing. Oh, they're cork fantastic. They're fantastic, yes. right? They, you just yeah. set them down. They don't move. Yep. You can draw lines. You yeah. know, you can draw curve lines with them because they're so thin and flexible. So they fit around pieces. And, and it starts at zero, right? It doesn't have that tiny little bit before the zero. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But the cork backing is it's the key. It's fantastic. Because they just we were, don't slip. We were using them in, your, in the class with you yeah. to... Uh, We'd clamp them down in the in the jaws in the of the horse. shaving horse because you yeah. didn't really care about it, and then wrap it around and, oh. and yeah. draw lines. Yeah, they're so across, thin you yep. can just wrap them around things, and you're, you're getting a straight line. And they're what, like At, two bucks or something? Something, yeah, dollar yeah. ninety nine, three ninety nine, something like that. That's a good one. Staples. I'm, I'm doing that. All right. Well, that's all for this episode of Shop Talk Live. If you have questions you'd like us to answer on the show, send them into shoptalkatalk.com. If you're watching on YouTube, click that thumbs up button. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode. Thanks for listening. Tacos. 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 He's just it's like super speed. <laughs>